Our text this morning is Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who see... see Excuse me, those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasing, the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we know that by faith we enter into the heavenly holy of holies through the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're grateful to be able to approach, and we do so with joy, with thanksgiving. We praise you and bless your name. Father, open our eyes to what we don't see. Fix our understanding of what we don't comprehend. Bless us as we come to your word. We praise things in Jesus' name, and amen. So 
So remember that Hebrews has been arguing that there are two holy of holies. There's the earthly one in the temple in Jerusalem, which the high priest enters each year with the blood of earthly sacrifices. And then there's the heavenly holy of holies, the true one, which the earthly holy of holies is just a copy of. And the heavenly holy of holies, Jesus Christ entered once and for all with the blood of his perfect sacrifice. And Hebrews has been, has been working to dissuade the, the reader from returning to that earthly te- uh, temple. And instead, look back at, at Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So he's been establishing there's this heavenly holy of holies. There's the high priest who is Jesus. Remember, he is the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, better than the Levitical priesthood. And he approaches into that holy of holies to offer that one perfect sacrifice. But the thing that we should notice is that he's been building us up to this point where we understand where we're supposed to go in, the the priest that we're supposed to be worshiping with. And it's Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. But now he tells us that when we go in, he says... Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Okay, and remember this last week that there was this culmination that the way that you go in is through faith. Okay, in, in, if you were to look back at Jerusalem, you could see how you walk into the Old Testament Holy of Holies. It's very visible. You understand how to approach. But now he's explaining there's a new place that we go, and you do this by faith. And so, so the whole thing has been building up to this argument that we need to have faith in Christ. We look to Christ in faith. And that's why now in chapter 11, he's going to turn to this great hall of faith. He's describing to us the significance of faith. You go into the, to go into the heavenly holy of holies, the way is Jesus Christ. You don't draw near through the blood of bulls and, and goats. You draw near through Jesus Christ. And the way you walk this path is faith. That's why Hebrews now turns to the subject of faith. In the previous chapter, he talked about what apostasy looked like. He, he, remember, last time he was talking about what it looks like when people fall away and they return to Jerusalem and the, and the sacrifice of blood there. So in the previous chapter, he talked about what apostasy looks like. But now, in chapter 11, he's going to give us this, this um, really stirring picture of what faithfulness looks like. What does it look like to actually endure and persevere with the one true thing, which is faith? So now he turns to um, give us, in, in verse 1, you know, this is that classic definition of faith. If, um, if you were, like, in a Bible memory program as a little kid, if you did Awanas or something like that, this is one of those classic texts that you, that you memorize, and then somebody would say, what is faith? And you always rattle off um, Hebrews 11.1, 1, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Um, the problem is, as soon as, you, as soon as you say it, particularly if you're, if you're like, um, arguing with a non-Christian, and they're saying, what is faith? It makes no sense. And then you give them this answer. As soon as you've given it, you realize it's kind of a cryptic verse. And, and they generally look at you like, what does that even mean? I, I, how, how is that something that I'm supposed to understand and, and be um, persuaded by? It's a very um, crypt, cryptic verse. Um, faith is when, when you hope for something, but somehow you, you possess the substance of that thing that you hope for. It's the substance of things hoped for. Or it's when you can't see something, but you have unseen evidence of that theme, that that thing, evidence of things unseen. Um, It's when you can't see something, but you have the evidence of that thing. So so what does that mean? Like, how how does that function? What does that mean? I think the first thing that, that we need to remember here is that when we start to understand a biblical definition of faith and how faith works, we see that, Faith is, um, faith is something, it's, it's not something that we conjure up on our own. Faith is not something you gin up and exercise on your own. We see from Scripture that faith is something that God gives to us. God, God puts that in your heart. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Faith is, is a gift that God drops into your heart. And when, you, and when you see it, it moves you in a certain direction. When you see that, that faith and, and that it is the work of God in your heart, then you see how, how suddenly the, the sudden appearance of faith in your heart is a testimony 
of something that you cannot see. Okay? When, when, when you suddenly hear the gospel and it makes sense and you realize that there is faith in you and you're receiving this by faith, it, it, it suddenly is a testimony to you of something that is true. It's not something you gin up, it's something that God puts in you. It's a testimony to you of the truth of God's promises that what he said will come to pass. Faith, the gift of God, puts into your heart an assured knowledge of something that you cannot see. Again, it's not something that you can build up. It's something that God puts into you. That means that, that faith is not an argument that you make to others. Faith is God's argument to you that he has called you from darkness to light. It's, it's something God is giving to you to argue you, um, to give you evidence of something. So now we turn from this definition of faith, we turn to a list of famous examples of what faith looks like. It takes us through this long list of kind of well-known Old Testament stories to identify for us various elements, kind of important elements to define how faith works, what it, what it looks like, the various important elements of saving faith. And I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull some of these themes out. I'm not going to go verse by verse through this, but I just want to point out a few of the important themes that, that Hebrews is giving us as, as it's giving us these Old Testament stories. One of the first things is that faith is, um, faith is not seen. Okay, faith is not seen. We see that faith gives you a knowledge of the truth of something, a knowledge without seeing. Faith gives you the ability to know the truth of something without having seen it or having evidence put in front of your eyes. We say, we say seeing is believing, but faith is believing without seeing. And this is something that, that uh, is made clear throughout this whole, um, this whole chapter. You look at, um, look at verse 3. He begins by pointing the very first story of Scripture, the story of creation. And the whole story of creation is something coming out of nothing. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. The seen world comes from, um, it, it comes out of nowhere. It comes from God's word. We don't see something that then leads us to the things that we can later see. It just all comes into existence by the word of God. God's creation of the world cannot be observed in a laboratory it cannot be re reproduced before the eyes. And therefore, knowledge of this is received by faith. Right? The knowledge of this has to be received by faith. Where is the planet that you can set the telescope on to watch creation unfold? That planet itself has to be something that is created. There's no, there's no place where we can step back and objectively and independently observe God's creative act because all that is was brought into being by his creative word. And therefore, it's a knowledge that is received by faith. We have God's testimony in Genesis 1 of where we come from, how he made the world, and we receive that by faith. Um, and faith is like this. Faith is like this. And so he's going to go on throughout uh, this story, constantly pointing out how faith doesn't, doesn't have a, um, something visible in front of it. It's, it's a, it, it, it doesn't come out like that. Look at uh, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Okay, so the point is that Noah receives word from God, a warning about a judgment that is to come. Where is the evidence of this? Where is the proof of this? Where is the telescope where he can look and see the approaching armies? Where is the, the, the meteorological report that tells him that this uh, you know, crazy weather event is about to come? None of that is put in front of Noah. He does not get to see anything. What he gets is the word of God saying, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something significant. And so... When he, when he receives the word of God, he begins to build the ark, but he's building the ark by faith. He believes the report that he has received. Um, notice it, it, says, it says here that um, he received, uh, uh, by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Okay? It, was, it was nothing that was presented to his eyes. Now, um, just to be clear, it's not that the object of his faith cannot be seen. Okay, the, the thing that was, that was to come, the flood water that was to come, would become visible. 
Um, it, 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 it's not that it, it could not be seen. It could not be seen yet. Um, when we see by faith, or I, I should say, what we see by faith, we will eventually see by sight. All right? we, and we see this in Scripture. We see by faith now, but there's a time then those things that we believe in will come to fruition. We're not, just, we're not um, putting our confidence in an imaginary realm that, that, that we never encounter. What we're putting our confidence in, what we're putting our faith in, is a promise of what God will do. It's a confidence that when he has revealed his will, his will will come to fruition. Okay, so, so uh, Noah receives the promise of God and he begins to act by faith on things that he could not yet see. Or, or um, we're told in, in verse 8 that Abraham was, was called to go to this place that he had not yet seen. So he, lives, he leaves everything in his homeland um, where, where he knows everything. He knows all the people. He knows all the places. He knows where he is. And God just tells him, Go to this place that you have not yet seen, you don't know anything about, um, but you're just going to go. Many of, many of you have moved to Moscow. I suspect that you spent a little bit of time on Google Earth or something like that before coming to Moscow. You spied out the land, you got a sense of what it was you were coming to. Um, uh, he has none of that. He's just told, go to this land, I'm telling you where to go, get up and go, and by faith, he moves. By faith, he begins uh, moving. But, uh, Sarah believed that she would have a son, even though years had shown her that she was barren. She had no evidence that, that she could have a child other than God's word. Or, or um, Moses, listen to, um, in, in, in verses 23 through 29, it describes his faith in leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Okay, He gets this word that you're to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, but Moses, and Moses does it, but look at verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Okay, he, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So the God who could not be seen spoke to him, and he persevered without seeing, um, because he could not see him, the one, but as if he had seen Okay, so he could not see, but he acts as if he had seen. Faith essentially becomes his eyes and gives him the vision that he walks, uh, that he walks in. So do you see what I mean? That faith, um, faith is not an argument then that we make to others. Faith is not an argument that we make to others. Faith is an argument that God makes to you. Faith is something that God puts in your heart and proves to you something that, that cannot be shown. The existence of faith in your heart is a testimony that God is working in you. Um, a lot of times people have, you know, wrestle with like, how do I know that I am saved? But we need to understand that faith is that assurance. Faith, faith is that promise. Faith is that testimony. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I mean, John will talk about in 1 John how when somebody says, this is what Jesus Christ is like, that he, that he was dead, buried, rose again from the dead, that he died for our sins. When somebody says that, that they're revealing that, they, that God has put something into their heart. Faith is, a te is God's testimony to you that he is taking you somewhere, that, that he is real and is doing something in your life. So the existence of faith in your heart is a testimony that God is working in you. Notice um, that in all the accounts that we have in, in Hebrews 11, in all these accounts, they didn't encounter things that got them to faith, Okay. They, they didn't encounter things that got them to faith. They didn't like um, encounter circumstance after circumstance that they slowly deduced from that this is probably what will happen. They didn't encounter things that got them to faith. They encountered faith. And then that faith took them somewhere. So they encountered faith itself and then faith moved them. Faith took them somewhere. And that's the thing is that the next thing I'll say. So, so faith um, has, um, is of things unseen. And the next thing that we see in Hebrews is that faith moves. Faith, faith makes you do something. When you have faith, it makes you move. As, as James says, James 2.20, faith without works is dead. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that um, you have to add works to faith in order to get saved. Some people will take that verse and they'll interpret it as like, so that means you have to have faith and you have to have works and you have to have both of these two things. It's like a recipe for salvation. You have to have one part faith, one part works. You put them together and you get saved. That's not what, that's not what James is saying. He's saying 
that true faith, true faith, the kind of faith that sees Christ as its object, will move you. He's not saying faith plus this. He's describing what real faith does in your life. The kind of, the kind of faith that sees Christ will move you. It will change you. It will make you do things. Faith that, that doesn't change you is not real faith, is not living faith. Noah, Noah gets this warning in verse 7, and he goes out and he builds a ridiculous boat, right? He, built, he builds an absurd boat that, that makes no sense. Why does he do it? Because he has faith. God has revealed something to him. He's received it by faith, and it makes him go out and do something. Had, had Noah received the more, th- that warning about the coming flood and then done nothing, we would not say that he um, believed it. We, we would not say that he believed the warning. He might say, I had a hunch that something like this would happen, but, but he's going to drown with everybody else, okay? Because a hunch is not the same thing as faith. Faith makes you move. Had Noah not built the, the ark, he would not have had faith. That would not have been true faith. Abraham left his homeland. He, in verse 8, he went out. God said, I want you to go there to this promised land. And he gets up, he packs everything, and he moves. Had he, had he stayed home, had he stayed where he was, he would not have had faith. Um, he lived in tents in a foreign land, verse 9. And he did this because he believed what God had told him. Had he stayed in his homeland, we would say he did not really believe. When you, when you believe, you act. When you believe, it, it, it changes your life. You, you act in a different way. Not because you need to have faith plus these works in order to be saved. It's these works flow out of real, true faith. Another element of, of faith is that um, it, it moves you, and because you are moved, you are separated from others. It, it, it changes you, and it makes you different from those that are around you. Um, Faith divides. Faith, faith divides. And that's one of the things you really see really clearly in, um, in Hebrews 11. Look again at the account of Noah. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. That moment when Noah begins the ark... Is, is Noah realizing God is judging this world. And, and if I'm in this world, I will be judged. And so I need, to, I need to build this ark, this picture of salvation that I'm going to step inside of. And in doing that, he is, he's making a distinction. That, you see, the wall of the ark makes a distinction between those that are saved and those that are lost. And he built that wall. He, under, he understood that, that this world is going somewhere and I need to be distinct from it. I need to be set apart from it. Otherwise, I will be judged with them. Listen to Genesis 6. Going back there for a moment. Start at verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. This is how you should make it. It goes on uh, to describe, uh, describe the construction of it. The obedience of Noah's faith included Noah submitting to God's judgment on the ungodliness of the world around him, a world that he no doubt had been somewhat attached to, right? There, 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 there's no way he wasn't somewhat attached to this world that he was in, this world that he knew the judgment is coming onto. Um, so th- there's, a, there's a judgment that is there. Now, I, I, said that, I said that faith moves you. When faith moved Noah, it caused him to separate himself from the world and to make room for God's wrath to halt. Ho- to fall. It's a hard thing to hear, I think, because we, we tend to think of faith as kind of sweet and hopeful. You know, if, if faith tends to have this sort of sweet, hopeful quality to it. But if you truly believe what God has said, you must understand that God calls his people to separate themselves from sin and from the, the world of sin. Look again at, at Hebrews um, verses 13 and 14. 
These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. To have faith, real faith, is to realize that this world, that we're pilgrims here, that, that, that there, there's something else, there's another city that our loyalty is to, and that we have to be ready to have some sort of fundamental distinction between ourselves and, and the world that is falling away. We are strangers here. We are looking forward to something better, to something else that, that God is doing. Look at how Moses' faith started. Verse 24, by, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Um, Moses refused to be identified with the house of Pharaoh, a house of great wealth, luxury, and power that could have been his, could have all been his. And he says, no, because he has faith in his heart. I'm going to separate myself from this. I will not allow myself to be identified with this. Instead, I'll identify over there with these people who are suffering and enslaved. I, th- these will be uh, my people. Look at verse uh, 27. Uh, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That faith, that invisible faith, um, caused him to identify himself with a different people. Or look at Rahab, verse 31. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. She did not perish because she forsook her nation to follow where God was, where God was calling her to. She walked away from everything that she had. And, and it's not just that she forsook it. She forsook it in the midst of its judgment. She understood God's judgment is falling on it, and she did not want to be a part of that, and she walked out from there. When you have faith, you cannot blend in with the world of unbelief. All right? Faith cannot be a little inner secret that, that you keep deep down in your heart. Right? It's, not, it's not this little inner quality. It's funny because it it's invisible, but it becomes quite visible when it, when it moves you. And when it moves you, you cannot blend in with the world. It makes you distinct. It makes you uh, angular and awkward in the world. Now, because of that, faith is hated by the world. But the next thing, a quality of faith, is that faith pleases God. God, um, there, there's something about real, true, biblical faith, living faith, that it becomes that sweet aroma to God. God loves true faith. What made, what made Abel's sacrifice pleasing when Cain's was rejected? Verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and, and through it he, being dead, still speaks. Um, he, Abel, brings a sacrifice with faith. And in that sacrifice of faith, he says, by faith, he had a more pleasing sacrifice. That sacrifice of faith, God looked at that and he saw something that he took great pleasure in. Something that was distinct from uh, Cain's sacrifice. Or or look at Enoch in verses 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. There was something something really... um, um, incredible about Enoch that God gave God great pleasure in his life. Well, what was it? It, it? We're told at the beginning of the verse, by faith, Enoch was taken away. It was his faith. And that's why we're told in verse six, you get this little explanation. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek, who diligently seek him, right? If, if you're going to come to God, remember we've been arguing that the way you approach God is through faith. If you want to come with God, you must do so with true and living faith. Why does faith please God? Because faith lays hold of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. Faith, faith reaches out and it takes hold of that perfect sacrifice, and that's why faith becomes pleasing before God. Faith is God's means for taking the perfect sacrifice and applying it to us. By faith, then, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is given to us, and that is what, why faith pleases God. This is, this is how, um, verse 2, okay, for, for by it, referring back to verse 1, faith, 
For by faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. That's the thing that unites everybody here is that these are people who were walking in faith. And that faith laid hold of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, it's worth noting, it's kind of interesting if you think about this for a moment, it's worth noting that every story that he has told here has been an Old Testament story. Every single one. Well, we started essentially in Genesis chapter 1, and we started working through, but we've told only Old Testament stories all the way through. Couldn't he have used a New Testament example? Um, are there, are there um, you know, the, the, the Gospels have already happened. Um, <clears throat> the early books of Acts have already happened. Couldn't he have taken examples from the lives of New Testament saints? Those, who, those whose confidence in the gospel may have been more similar to ours. They, they, they knew the story of Jesus Christ and their faith would have been more clearly on Jesus Christ, it would seem. Could he not have used New Testament examples? By faith, John the Baptist confronted the evil of Herod. By faith, Stephen confessed Christ before that angry mob. You, you've got a lot of, um, you've got uh, James, the brother of John, has been martyred by now. Or you could list um, old, uh, New Testament saints performing Performing miracles, um, escaping from prison, healing the sick, even raising the dead. Surely there, there's plenty of New Testament examples, and if we're trying to talk about what Christian faith looks like, maybe it would have been more, um, more helpful or more illustrative to us to have used a New Testament example. But instead, Hebrews lists all works of faith performed by Old Testament saints, and he's using Old Testament saints to give us a series of examples of what our faith is supposed to be like. What, what our faith is supposed to be like. This is because, and remember, just step back for a moment, the larger argument of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews has been arguing all along that the Old Testament saints were saved by faith just like us. Their salvation, it's the same salvation that we have. Remember that Hebrews has been telling us that there's only one effective sacrifice. Uh, Hebrews 10 14, for by one offering, he is perfected forever those who are being sacrificed, sanctified. For by one offering, the offering of Jesus Christ, he has perfected forever those who are being um, sanctified. All salvation, all comes through that one sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that one sacrifice of Jesus Christ is, is received for all time, either Genesis 1, all the way up to uh, 2023, all, for all time, that one sacrifice has been applied through faith. And so all of these Old Testament saints are examples of the same saving faith that we have. Old Testament saints were saved by looking forward by faith at Christ Jesus, just as we are saved looking back by faith at Christ. But we all look at Christ by faith. This is why Old Testament saints can serve as an example for us of what faith looks like. They were looking at the same thing as us. Um, verse 13. These all died in faith, referring to all the patriarchs he's, he's listed so far. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Okay? They haven't received Christ yet because Christ hasn't come, but they see him and they're looking towards him. Having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them. They believed in the coming promise of Jesus Christ and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Okay, they, the promise they saw was Christ, but Christ had not yet come. And look at the very end of chapter 11, verses 39 and 40. All, all these, again, referring to all this, the Old Testament saints he's referred to so far, all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Christ had not yet come. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. We were all to be perfected in the same moment in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And at that moment that Jesus enters into the Holy of Holies and applies the, the, the blood of his sacrifice in that uh, heavenly Holy of Holies, all the Old Testament saints who have been looking forward and all of us uh, New Testament saints who are looking backward, all of us were perfected in that moment all together. We were perfected with them. That means that, uh, that uh, Noah, that uh, 
um, Abraham, that Moses, that they are your brothers in Christ, or that Sarah or Rahab, they are your sisters in Christ because we were all perfected together at that same moment. The perfection did not come until Christ came, and we all, Old Testament saints and Christian saints, have all been perfected together in that one perfect sacrifice that we receive by faith. So we're called to live a life of faith modeled after our elders in the Old Testament. Uh, we, see, um, we see what cannot be seen because God has put this knowledge in our heart. Or as Paul says, we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We walk by faith and not by sight. All right? we, we don't see, but we believe. And because we believe, we do walk. We do, we do go. We do move. And this faith should be apparent in your life. It, it should show up in your life. Your life should be dis, uh, different because of it. It should make you different from the world. We, li, we live, think of this for a moment. We live at a moment of great division in our, our nation, right? Um, and I would say that division seems to have, over the last couple of years, gotten uh, extremely um, uh, intense and severe. Particularly, that, that sort of line between conservatives and, and liberals gets stronger and stronger. And I think it's pretty safe to say that the Christian uh, worldview lives much more comfortably on the conservative side of that line than, than it does on the liberal side. But I think it's really important that we make very clear that Christianity is not synonymous with conservatism. Uh, and the way in which we stand out and are, um, are different from the world should not just be because we embrace conservative values, okay? So, so um, living in Moscow, um, attending a church like Christ Church, you are um, certainly accustomed to being a bit angular with regard to the world around you, particularly, I think, in, in this town. Um, but let me, let me ask you, if you were put in a town with, uh, that was 100% unwoke but unregenerate Republicans, okay, would all of your tension and separation go away? Would, would you just suddenly blend like in and be not different uh, in any way at all? Is your understanding of how you are to live differently, is it restricted to conservative politics? Or do you have a life of faith that is powered by the gospel where, where because the spirit is in you and because you walk by faith, you live differently and, and, and your life is distinct because of that and not necessarily just because of a conservative political position that you take. So to be clear, um, we, we don't just want people to see that uh, boys can't be turned into girls or that national debt is not the same thing as cash flow or that gas-powered stovetops are not from Satan, okay? Um, you know, all, all issues that we see around us now, these are, and these are worthwhile things uh, to be fighting for and to be articulating. I'm not backing away from that whatsoever. Worthwhile things. And, and, and we would like people to understand that. We'd like our town to get clear on some of these things. But ultimately, what we want is for people to see Christ, and Christ is a little bit different than that, right? Ultimately, what we want is Christ, Christ living in us, Christ overflowing in our lives, Christ received by faith, us made distinct by that, that gospel faith, and then the world changed by that kind of life. Um, we want the world to see that he is the one perfect sacrifice and that he is the only atonement for sin. We want, as our church motto goes, we want all of Christ for all of life, uh, for all the world. We want, we want all of Christ for all of life, for all of the world. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for the great cloud of witnesses that you have given us. We thank you for the testimony of faith in their lives, and we ask that you would work um, the same work in our lives. Would you give the faith of Noah, the faith of Abraham, the faith of Moses to us? Let us see the unseen, make us bold in our witness, and give us a good testimony. And we pray as your son taught us to pray, saying, again from Hebrews 11, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Know whom you are trying to please, and keep your eyes on him. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.